Hello, everyone. My name is Rajay, and I'm a platform engineer at SafeGraph. I've been in the platform and infrastructure field for just over six years now, mainly at startups, and my day-to-day -day focus has been on creating tools and workflows to help engineers become more productive at their daily tasks. I'm currently on the platform team at SafeGraph, which is a geospatial data company that provides high precision data on over 40 mil 41 million places around the world. We provide data sets of detailed, accurate, and up-to-date information on points of interest and their attributes. Today, I'm going to be sharing our configuration management journey at SafeGraph. We're going to start off with a brief overview of what configuration management is, and then we're going to talk about how we manage configurations in the early days and some of the challenges that we ran into. Next, we're going to dive into the new config management system that we built. And finally, I'm going to share some examples of how our, how our new system has helped us streamline our Spark development process. OK, so first of all, what is configuration management? Well, configuration management is a process for organizing, versioning, testing, and releasing your application configs across different environments. Modern day applications use a bunch of different configurations, such as database endpoints and credentials, third party API tokens, caching settings, logging settings, or S3 bucket names and paths. So how did SafeGraph do configuration management in the early days? Well, the short answer is that we didn't really have a proper system. So our configurations were scattered throughout our code base and various platforms. We had some configs stored in Kubernetes config maps and environment variables. We had others in Lambda functions, and we had others hard-coded in our code. We also had some in Airflow's variable store. And finally, we had some parameters set as environment variables in our Databricks cluster configurations. So obviously, the lack of a proper system for managing these configs introduced some challenges. For example, we had no way to answer who, why, what, or when when it came to auditing config changes. We also lacked a review and approval process for updating configs. And it was pretty difficult for us to share configurations between different applications and environments. And finally, we had some places where we hard-coded credentials and secrets in plain text, which definitely wasn't ideal. Now I want to share with you two real-life examples of how the old system frequently caused us headaches and trouble. So in one situation, we were running a migration script, which had a bug. And that bug ended up resetting all the rows in our customer configuration table to some default value. Now this was a really important table because that table determined which products we would deliver to our customers each month. And what ended up happening was that we delivered the wrong data sets to all our customers because of this bug. So to get the old configurations back, we had to go through this long and complex process of restoring an RDS snapshot to a new cluster, exporting the data to a file, and then importing that into our existing RDS cluster. We then had to deliver all the data to our customers again. Now in another situation, we wanted to update one of our API endpoints that was used by a variety of our services across different code bases. Now this endpoint was hard coded everywhere, which meant we had to open multiple PRs and spend a significant engineering effort to roll out this change. The problem was, even after all this effort, we still ended up missing a few places where the endpoint was being, where the old endpoint was being used. And so when we went ahead and deprecated the old endpoint, this caused a few applications to break because we'd forgot to update them. So the pattern of hard-coded configurations made it difficult for us to roll out these types of changes and reduce our overall development velocity. So our old config management system made it clear to us that we would benefit from a new approach. And that's why we, said, we set out to go and build one. Here you can see the architecture of the new configuration management system that we built. So at its core is the Spring Cloud Config Server. And this is an open source configuration service that allows clients to fetch configurations through an HTTP API. Clients 
clients can provide parameters like application name, uh, config version, and a profile when fetching configurations from the server. And the config server uses Git as one of its storage backends, which allowed us to store our configurations on GitHub and benefit from all the great features that GitHub provides, like pull requests. We also created some config client libraries in Python and Scala to help engineers use the configuration service without directly calling the HTTP API. So how does our config repo look like? Well, we currently store, we store all of our configurations in a single configuration repository on GitHub. Each application gets its own directory that has one or more configuration files. If you take a look at, if you take a look at the example on the right, you can see that each service has a base config file and two environment specific config files. Now, when a client requests a, con a configuration for a specific application in a specific environment, the config server merges the base file with the environment specific file before returning the result to the client. This feature makes it really easy to share parameters across different environments and makes it easy to set a, a common base configuration for your application. Now, as for managing secrets, we definitely didn't want to store them as plain text in our configuration files. And although Spring Config Server supports encrypted content, it had very limited access controls, which didn't meet our needs. So our solution was to store secrets in AWS SSM Parameter Store and to refer to those secrets using their path in the YAML config files. If you take a look at the top right, we have a sample config file that contains a reference to an SSM parameter. The configuration key starts with a special prefix, sg underscore secret, and that prefix tells our config libraries to automatically fetch the parameter's value and populate it into the configuration object returned by the client. That way, our users don't need to manually handle loading any secrets from SSM. The config library takes care of that for them. And since we're using an AWS service, we can easily use IAM rules and policies to manage access to our secrets. So now I wanna share with you two ways our config system has helped us streamline our Spark development processes at SafeGraph. So as a data company, we use Spark pretty extensively at SafeGraph, and we have anywhere from hundreds to thousands of Spark applications running every day. Our engineers spend a lot of time building, testing, and iterating on their Spark applications. And then once they're done, they, need, they launch Spark jobs from places like Airflow, services, or locally using our Spark CLI. Because of the importance of Spark at our company, one of the platform team's goals has always been to build tools to help improve our Spark development processes. One of the challenges we faced with EMR on EKS, which is what which is what we use for as our Spark service provider, is that their API to launch a Spark job requires a pretty verbose and lengthy set of parameters. And these parameters need to be duplicated by engineers everywhere and every time they want to trigger a job line. So to improve our engineers' development experience, we built tooling on top of our configuration system to simplify the process of launching these jobs. So what we did was we defined a set of default job parameters and EMR on EKS parameters in our centralized configuration system. And we had our tooling use those parameters as the base template when launching a Spark job. So the end result was that engineers only had to specify the parameters directly related to their job. And we were able to eliminate 90% of the boiler boilerplate configurations that they would usually need to add. If you take a look at the code snippet on the left, and that's an example of the parameters an engineer would need to pass to the EMR on EKS API to start a job. And if you take a look at the code snippet on the right, you can see the new simplified parameter list that they would need to provide. This simplicity has helped our engineers iterate a lot more quickly while building their Spark applications and has reduced confusion 
among has reduced confusion on what parameters they need to provide. Now, on the operational side of things, one of the challenges our platform team faced was a need for a centralized and consistent way of managing our Spark platform. Our config system helped us achieve this by allowing us to control all our Spark platform parameters from a single directory in our configuration repo. If you look at the code snippet on the right, that's a real example of our Spark platform's configuration file. Now, as you can see, we're able to control things like Docker image ID, uh, availability zones to launch jobs in, driver and executor pr parameters, all from a single place. This has helped the platform team easily roll out global platform-wide changes without needing to touch a single line of user code in the process. And as a result, now we're able to push out bug fixes and new features a lot more frequently than we could have in the past. Overall, our new config management system has been a success and we've been able to use it in a lot of different great ways. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and that you learned something new today that you can apply to your own configuration management journey. Thank you.